Welcome to Lockdown Army episode three. We started off pretty powerfully. We've got some very cool converted models. This guy turned out particularly well. He's looking pretty good. All the tattoos have been smoothed out and stuff like that. I will be deciding what we do with exactly goes in his hand. Has some amazing suggestions. What we're gonna be concentrating on in this episode is taking those conversions that we made rough and just smoothing them out a little bit, a little bit of green stuff, making things physically secure. I really want this army to be something that I don't need to be super delicate with when I'm holding, when I'm painting, never mind if I ever play with it. What else we're gonna be deciding is basing. Now I've got a load of different noisy sources of inspiration for this. I've got some old kits that I've had and then I've got some newer ones as well. So this one's got, look at that. It's got a big chapel tower with a bell in it. I love the idea of that. This one is kind of, if you are looking to find light sources, you need this. So it might not look it kind of at first glance, it's just some ruined scenery, but it's absolutely packed with these, which you can stick on anything, which is just so unbelievably useful. You could also chop them off and have them in a hand or stick them on top of other weapons or on top of a banner or something crazy like that. It's got these more, far more substantial, larger ones. One thing that I'm really keen on is sticking with I know it's all made up, but sticking with a the theme. So I don't like the idea of my light sources coming from like glowing weapons, or I don't want something to look like a bright blue power sword blade or whatever. This is gonna be hopefully old, scary, rusty, bloody, maybe covered in wear and tear, but the special effects hopefully aren't gonna be coming from the weapons, maybe unless it was something a bit more warp stony or evil. So that means they're gonna to need to come from magical sources. So flames, be they magical, colored or otherwise, um, pendants, amulets, orbs, you know, all, all the, the cliched magical stuff, the eyes of skulls, whatever it is, but they can't come from weapons, I don't think. So you can't always get a organic source of a glow on a model. And if that is gonna be a large part of my paint scheme, which I think it is, I need to find other ways for it to come from organically. And it's very easy to just pillar, thing, done. Um, we can do that all over the army. So that is the idea of picking stuff like this, particularly scenery kits that are, the more modern they are, the easier they tend to be to build. Um, these pillars are a dream, like really don't take much time. And I've spent enough time assembling things in a fancy way with the conversions that I don't want stuff that I'm not gonna convert to be like multi-part difficult, drying time, whatever it is, or have huge gaps or something like that. So it's a really big part for me in terms of my personal enjoyment. I pick kits that are fun, fast, and practical and not confusing with hundreds of parts. So without further ado, let's jump into the kind of building, choosing and converting and see where the week takes us. Here we have our beastie who is looking really intimidating, but there are some parts of him that I need to neaten up as well as some parts where there's little seal lines that have snuck through and stuff like that. The weight and length of this has caused it to droop during drying. Now I could cut it off and go again, but it's got some type of a bond there. And actually, because I just want it basically like that, instead of droopy where it is, I'm not gonna be taking a wholesale approach to it. So one of the things that I think no one watching this will be aware of, or very few will be aware of, is what sprue goo is. It is the shavings and mess from our last video turned back into liquid plastic, believe it or not. So I'm gonna pick out the finest bits that I have, the, uh, the really fluffy, annoying shavings, I'm going to put them on a piece of plastic which isn't going to melt, so not plastic hard or something like that. And actually these guys are going to get broken down again into their base material. So how we're going to do that is put some drops of this on, and then with the back of a brush I'm just going to mush them together. And it happens quite fast. If you've got any bigger bits in there you will need to leave it for a bit longer or just not pick those up. That is liquid plastic. So. The bonuses of using this over green stuff, and there are definitely some negatives. You cannot sculpt this, but you can place it. You can choose how thick it is, depending on how much of this or how thin it is, add more glue. And then we should be able to drop it into areas like here and here. And we're not getting a bond of two different products there. All of it will be fused chemically together with a proper plastic bond. And you could then sand that, drill it, pin it, um, like scrape it with a knife, sand it down, anything that you could do with plastic you're going to be able to do with 
four rings do here. Between that and green stuff, I should be able to neaten up the areas, but also solidify them and make something that feels not delicate on the tabletop. Thank you very much for the suggestions of everyone in the previous video who spoke about using heat and water, specifically heated water, to bend parts. I'm gonna be making loads of use of that with a method that I've used before. Here is a gorgeous scenic base that I've made on one of my own personal armies before. When we are cutting our plastic card, to size, which we'll do by drawing a kind of wavy band and then following that with a knife. We just need to make sure that both the ends end up being roughly the same height because then we can have a nice kind of organic joining point. If one's up here and one's down here and you have to have a really aggressive slope, it will completely ruin the effect. I find it easier to do curves in a particular direction, but whatever works the best for you. Again, I don't want it too high, but if you do it a bit extra, you can always sand things down. So they're probably a little bit too aggressive, so I'll draw a second one. There we go, second time lucky. Now I find it's often actually easier to get a smoother line when you're cutting rather than when you're drawing. Let's see if that's the case here. Okay. Okay, so that's our joining point. So today we're going to be cooking, no we're not cooking actually, um, we are however going to be cooking this. So um, if we take a little look in the pan, I've got some boiling water and I've got this on a low heat. I'm not going to give you a gas mark or anything, you just want it just about boiling or just about not boiling. Use tools, I've got indestructible fingers so I probably won't use them, but uh, use tools, that's why I recommend it. Pick a pan which has the smallest possible um, circumference and then we're gonna try and lower everything in at the same time. So starting with the middle to help it bend, you're gonna get that in. Just treat it like it's spaghetti, if in doubt, and then we're gonna pop the rest of it in there. Now, we might have to do a little bit of fiddling with this in terms of getting the bends in all the sections we need, but simply push it towards the edges and that should coax it to be pretty much what you need. What I'm gonna do now dip different bits in, take them out, curl them round, and once you've curled something, don't put it back in because it will go back to its natural shape quite easily. So after heating, I'll curl it, and then hopefully we'll end up with something like that. Perfect. You can run this under cold water if you need to at the end just to kind of set it. It sets pretty fast though. To fix the straight ends, which are going to be the single probably most problematic point, what I'm going to do is very selectively I'll turn the temperature up to bring the water to the boil. Weird. Um, dip the very ends in and then really quick take them out, shake off the excess and stress them in the orientation that I'm after. The ends are going to be the bits that are the worst. The middle will probably be absolutely perfect. Um, so I'm just going to do that with the ends and hopefully there that one's worked a little bit better Actually, that's quite a natural circle on this part. You're never going to get it perfect, but it's flexible so we can fix that Okay, so on to the basic now one thing I want you to bear in mind is this is a particular method that is not the most efficient I would love your suggestions as to how you do things fast whilst keeping it organic and working with nice materials I've just used the same piece of plastic card that I started with so pretty much all of this base until we hit the green stuff um, has been made with one single like one pound 20 sheet of plastic card which is a pretty useful thing to be able to do. This is one of my preferred ways to work and basically the entire process is very organic so any mistakes I make I follow them up with just hiding them with the next stage or I will realize halfway through that actually I do like the idea of mushrooms coming out from under that or I'm gonna use a really big bit of slate, therefore this has to move here and this has to move here and I'm quite happy to go back in and hack it, it kind of, it's not a neat process until the very final steps and the sand which finishes it off, that's a really important part of it. So you'll see me spend a lot of time working on making sure that the base ends here and the sand ends here and there is no like wobbly weird middle bit between the two of them, it's one just cuts cleanly into the other. One little tip is that I like to mix in a bit of black paint or dark paint, whatever color you like, with my PVA, the basing, and what that allows is anywhere where you're kind of, you're in a nook or a cranny and the sand's gone in there. Um, a lot of the time when you prime your miniature, the sand really stands out in the recesses. It'll still be pale, white, um, kind of beigey, ivory colored, and that doesn't make any sense in the shadows. So that is where we've ended up, basing wise. And it's all turned out 
super nicely. Really pleased with that. Um, the finishing touches make it, it's always the case, isn't it? Uh, you can put however much time you want to into the beginning and then what actually matters is that I put sent like seven mushrooms on there and five skulls and a twig. <laughs> it's kind of depressing when you think about it, isn't it? Really pleased with that, super solid end result. And that is asking for painting. It's gonna be quite difficult to paint. I've not glued on the tail yet. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with the tail because it really is in the way and stuff like that drives me crazy. Uh, without the tail on, it's actually not too bad for access to any point in the base. So I'm slightly tempted to glue the tail on afterwards, which is gonna be really difficult to get a good bond on, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, I think. It has dried overnight and I'm gonna quickly go over with a dry brush and then a stiffer brush just to remove any excess sand that we've got that hasn't dried to it. I'm just gonna sneak a little bit of texture paint in the deepest recesses of this base. And the reason for that is I want certain parts of it to look a little bit more wet. So with this stuff, I'm just popping it down fairly thick and then I'm using water to phase it out. And hopefully that should lead to a kind of nice natural looking blend. It's also gonna allow me to sneak it into some areas where I've only got green stuff there currently. But um, having a couple of textures in here, I'm sure will be a benefit to the kind of final overall look. Okay, so you don't know until you try. I want to see, um, following on from a load of amazing suggestions, someone said about literally having a bird hatching out of an egg or something like that. The, the kind of avian weird theme that we could have here, I wanna see if it works. So I'm gonna build this endless spell, which is from the endless spells box, um, the birdies, and I'm gonna see how that looks in the hand. Might not work, but you know, it, it really helps to try this stuff out and I should probably build this model at some point anyway. So with his tail blue tacked on and those birds blue tacked on, that is a really funky looking model. That is legit one of the, probably one of the um, kit bashes or conversions I've done that I've been the most proud of ever, I think. Turned out really, really nicely. And his base, which obviously we've spent a lot of time on today, is doing a real good job of showcasing and just planting him solidly in environment. I think that that is a display-ish base and it gives you, in no uncertain terms, the idea that he is coming from a natural environment that is slightly fungal, slightly rotting. Um, what color do we paint him? Please let me know below. Let me know what you think of the birds as well. I think they work really quite nicely. It might be that they're too over the top and it could be uh, a little bit more subtle and less dramatic, but overall better if you just had one bird or two or something like that. I quite like the idea that there could be an, a cracked egg with the birds coming from them and then something dripping down from it. You know, he's just cast a spell, something to do. Wizard's magic, you know, wizard did it something like that. It is worth taking the time on these things to get to a result that you are happy with. And um, often, I think a little bit of time uh, between sessions gives you loads of opportunity to think, actually, I could try this out, I could try that out. And um, once your ideas have kind of percolated and distilled, or you've got a load of amazing feedback, thank you, viewers, um, you can then put it into practice and see how that looks on the miniature. That is baller. I've no idea how I'm gonna paint it. We'll arrive at that at some point soon. I've given myself a lot of flexibility though. I could be adding tufts and vegetation to closer to do, like closer towards his feet or further from his feet with kind of um, corruption and like black inky oily stuff coming out from his feet. So either he could be a cause of natural growth or the opposite. He could be just like bleaching the surrounding environment with corruption or whatever. Um, I love both of those ideas. I don't know which one I would like to choose. Andrew Price, who has got me Googling moldy sloths, which is something I never thought I'd do. They're gonna be a really, really good reference point for exactly how organic and kind of uh, entrenched in their environment these things could be if I want them to be. I hadn't considered that, and it was a, a really, really good touch point as kind of a key thematic theme for the entire army. Please get in contact with us via social media or support at artist-opus.com. Do keep your suggestions coming in and keep them rolling, whether it is for future videos or for this army in particular. We read each and every one and they have massively informed kind of where we're at now, both with the channel and with this miniature. So that's it. Please like, comment, subscribe, and we will catch you in the next video. Yeah.